Officer Stevens decided to take a picture of the object. I got out, went to the trunk, grabbed the Polaroid, snapped a picture of it, and then I watched it bank, and then it went toward the Dupo St. Louis direction and cleared over the tree line that you see there. But Stevens' picture provided only a faint glimpse of the strange object. It was definitely uh, no aircraft. I mean, this thing was huge. It was approximately two stories thick and and maybe the length of a football field. I mean, it was it was huge. Officer Stevens wanted to document his experience. I rushed back to the the station and drew a quick sketch of what I had seen. Then I uh, made a like an unofficial report. You know, because I didn't want to make an official report on it. I documented everything that I heard, the times and such as that. Officer Stevens presented this report to Milstadt Police Chief Ed Wilkerson. Okay, I've worked with Craig for over three years, and uh, his, his, his credibility is very good. And he was very excited when I came in the next morning. He was, he was pretty excited about it. I believe that he saw something. I don't know what he saw, but uh, I believe that he saw something. 4.37 a.m. The fifth witness was a police officer from still another jurisdiction, Dupo, Illinois. He reported the object continued on a southwestern trajectory towards St. Louis. At approximately 7 a.m., nearly two and a half hours later, along the same flight path, Stephen Wanacott, a high school English teacher, was driving to work. It was just, just before 7 o'clock in the morning, and it was still pretty dark. I noticed something in the sky, and at first I thought it was an airplane coming from a nearby airport. But as I looked at it, I saw that it had no navigation lights, the red and green lights that an airplane normally carries. And I noticed it had these three bright lights from one side of it shining down. Mr. Wanacott was able to observe some additional details as dawn illuminated the object. As the sun came up, I could see that it was uh, distinctively arrowhead more than triangular. It appeared to be motionless, and I could see that it didn't have a pair of wings uh, or a, a horizontal stabilizer or any of the, the, the configuration normally associated with an airplane. Six eyewitnesses, four of them from four different police departments, reported a flying object with a shape that varied from a triangle to a two-story house. But many features, such as the lighting configuration and the object's ability to hover, were very similar. There were no videotapes and only one indistinct photograph. But the quality of the eyewitnesses and the commonality of their accounts makes this sighting unusual. It was time for an investigation to begin. quickly about the unidentified flying object that had flown over the cities of Highland, Lebanon, and Milstadt in southern Illinois on January 5th, 2000. It wasn't long before local media picked up the story. I'll be honest, at first I was skeptical, and then I went to the Millstop Police Department and talked to the chief there, and he was believing his own officer, and they showed me the picture of the Polaroid, and it wasn't great, but then he told me about the other police departments and the man in Highland, Illinois, who saw it. And then you begin to think, gee, this is really something. All these police departments in different locations. It made it sound a lot more credible than other UFO sightings I've ever covered. Day two. Calls continue to pour into the Milstadt police station. A lot of uh, actually worldwide attention came in on this. And uh, we kind of all put our heads together and kind of come up with the idea maybe we should just we have a website you know why don't we just go ahead and post this information on the website traffic to the website increased as thousands of people logged on to download the report with the picture and sketches drawn by officer stevens St. Louis news reporter Lisa Zygman heard about the story the next day. I came in and we were talking about it. We had a couple of calls that um, some police officers may have had a report and they had to respond to a sighting of something. It, it might have been a UFO sighting, but it was enough that we went around the table and there were a lot of X-File jokes and I went out to go figure out what it was about. 
Lisa interviewed each of the witnesses. They all seemed credible, but she was particularly impressed with statements from Officer Craig Stevens. He was great. He was just very compelling, and he was laughing at it at first, saying, look, I, I know what you're thinking. I was thinking the same thing when I heard the report on the radio, and he just thought somebody was drinking, and he goes, but I'm telling you, I saw it. I'll take you out there. I'll show you what I saw. I drew a picture of it. I don't know what it is, but it was something. It was something I've never seen before. I interview a lot of people. I see a lot of different stories out there. I know when they're lying. I know when they're credible. I I'd give this guy a 10. He was credible. And while these eyewitnesses may have seen something unexplained, Lisa refused to make any leaps into the unknown. No one is saying that these were aliens or somebody from a different planet. I think the, the bottom line and the focus from uh, our viewers and from the officers was that this is probably something military. The nearest military installation is Scott Air Force Base, located in the middle of the object's flight path. However, records from the night of January 5th, 2000, seem to rule out local military involvement. Checking with our experts who work at airfield operations in the control tower, we found that uh, our airfield was closed during that time. Our control tower was closed, so there was no way that there could have been an aircraft operating in and out of Scott Air Force Base, and that there was no military tie to this sighting. These military denials left people anxious for other answers, but the investigation was long on eyewitnesses and short on photos or videotape of the flying object. St. Louisans and, and people in Missouri, uh, we're from the show me state. You know, if you don't see it, there's not much reaction. Show me, show me the picture. Show me what these officers saw. Dispatch, I see the object. Notified DuPo. Although no clear photos or videotape existed, the caliber of eyewitnesses made it possible to undertake a different kind of investigation. Animation is now accepted in the courtroom as a way of reconstructing events. By following the same technical procedures, it was thought that the object observed over Illinois might be recreated with equal accuracy. David Massa has worked on more than 175 legal cases. At his company, Sigma Animation, accuracy is their business. And with each investigation, their reputation is at stake. Sigma Animation does very few commercial projects, and I have to say that this particular uh, project, the UFO over Illinois project, is definitely unique. We have never done anything like this before. For the purposes of this investigation, Sigma Animation was contracted to use eyewitness testimony and data from the field to create a three-dimensional representation of the unidentified flying object that flew over Southern Illinois on January 5th, 2000. At first, David Massa was reluctant to accept the project. However, it occurred to me that it isn't my job or responsibility to determine whether or not these people saw a UFO or not. My responsibility is to take their opinions and depict it as accurately as I possibly can. The first task of the investigation was to gather extensive data from each of the sighting locations. It was necessary to hire a survey crew to get some basic measurements of the environment as well as to have the witnesses actually look through the survey equipment to kind of give us an idea of the location in a 3D environment of where they believe they saw this object. We've got some piece of surveying equipment here that we're going to try to use to 